Good afternoon. I'm Stefanos Polizoides, Dean of the School of, Ar of Architecture at the University of, of Notre Dame. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Lara Zurica to back to our campus. Um, it is uh, midnight in uh, Jordan, I believe, so she is uh, brave to have stayed up this long to, to address us tonight. She is a, a distinguished architect um, in Amman, Jordan, and a graduate, a graduate of our school, a fact we are terribly proud of. <laughs> I would like to um, ask Professor John Meller, who was a classmate of Lara's in the class of 1995, to give her a full introduction. John. Uh, thank you, Dean Pelizoides. Um, I just have a few words I wanna say uh, before we let Lara uh, go ahead and make her presentation. Um, while studying architecture as an undergraduate student here at Notre Dame, um, when we were in Rome, my class took a day trip to the Villa d'Este in Tivoli um, where we explored the Renaissance garden, uh, including its terraces and its cascades of water. Um, and even today, more than 27 years after we were at that uh, particular place, uh, every time I smell uh, a freshly clipped hedge, I'm immediately taken back to that place and that, at that point in time um, where I experienced that garden. I actually spent a very pleasant afternoon with my classmates there. So why am I telling you this? Um, there are two reasons that come to mind. First, uh, as the Dean mentioned, Lara Zarekat, our presenter tonight, was a classmate of mine while I was studying in Rome. And so when I visited Villa d'Este, she was there with me that very same day, which is a very lovely memory for me and it's not at all embarrassing for her or me either. Um, second of all, and probably more germane to today's presentation, uh, is the lesson that sensory experiences of well-designed places can be permanently, even viscerally imprinted in our memories especially in gardens where we're surrounded by sights and smells and sounds. It's obvious to me that Lara learned this lesson too, as her work as a landscape architect surely attests. But that's enough about my memories. You're here tonight to listen to what Lara has to say. So for those of you that don't know her, let me in her, introduce, introduce you to her. Lara is one of the leading designers in the field of landscape architecture in Jordan, and is the Associate Director for the Center for the Study of the Built Environment in Amman. Lara's work at the CSVE has focused on the design of native water conserving landscapes. She designed the first model water conserving park for the Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts and led an extensive public resource and publication program promoting the use of drought tolerant flora in landscape design. Lara has also collaborated with local and international architecture firms on notable institutional and urban projects, such as the Palestinian Museum Hub in Beer Site the Rainbow Street Regeneration Project, the Amman Master Plan, and the Dead Sea Development Zone Cornish District. Lara's work is rooted in connection to place and the integration of natural processes to create relevant and sustainable landscapes. Lara received the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2019 for her work on the Palestinian Museum. She holds a Master's of Landscape Architecture degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Notre Dame. Welcome, Lara. Thank you, John, for that introduction and for uh, taking us back to our, our lovely time in Rome. Um, good afternoon to you all and uh, good evening to anyone in my time zone. Um, I think I should start sharing my screen. Can everyone see it? Yes, we can see it. So um, it's truly a pleasure and a privilege to be invited to speak to uh, the students and the faculty at, at my alma mater. It was uh, 25 years ago uh, that John and I were both students here uh, and we spent many, many nights uh, grinding sumi ink and uh, stapling watercolor paper um, and uh, made uh, lifelong friendships and uh, of course learned uh, formative skills that have uh, served me well over the years. Um, and it was here at Notre Dame that I took a landscape seminar class uh, that changed the course of my career into uh, landscape architecture. Um, the opportunity to speak here has been uh, conducive to reflection. Uh, and this reflection is compounded uh, uh, by 
um, during this time when all our lives and um, our routines have been disrupted, uh, disrupted by the pandemic um, in an unprecedented manner and uh, on a global scale. So my heart goes out to the students and the faculty having to deal with these disruptions. Um, I thought I would uh, speak to you today about what I found rewarding uh, and inspiring on both a intellectual and emotional level and what I'm passionate about and what has given me a sense of purpose. So uh, I find this quote by Louis Kahn uh, has resonance at this particular time. It makes me think about um, uh, what we select, what affinities we have, uh, what elements we choose to integrate, and what do we love. And I'd like to structure the talk around themes or approaches that I've been exploring through design work and applied research. Uh, I've tried to distill uh, what I've been pursuing um, and selected one notable project, the Palestinian Museum, and other smaller expo explorations uh, around certain themes that end up um, informing the larger body of work. So uh, these themes uh, or recurring uh, themes or explorations are cultural expression and placemaking, addressing the perennial landscape, inhabiting different habitats, public outreach, uh, education and community engagement. But before I get into the details uh, of the various themes, I'd like to share with you a little information about the landscape context in Jordan. Um, as you can see, there's a diversity of landscapes ranging from uh, pine and oak forests to arid landscapes, such as the deserts of Wadi Ram and Wadi Araba and uh, perennial watercourses, such as uh, Wadi Mujib. And incidentally, um, Films like Aladdin, one of the Star Wars, and The Martian were filmed in the desert of Wadi Ram, which is um, this landscape here. Um, so these diverse landscapes are categorized according to different biogeographic regions uh, associated with vegetation types, ranging from Mediterranean to semi-arid and even subtropical. And what's quite unique uh, about uh, this diversity that it exists in a very relatively actually small area of 89,000 square kilometers, which is roughly uh, the size of the state of Maine, which is about 91,000 square kilometers. Uh, and that's actually why Jordan is uh, a good location for uh, filming and shooting films. So this diversity of landscape that I've been talking about is uh, best exemplified by the meeting of two very different trees in one area. One is the acacia tree and the other is the Aleppo pine. Uh, the acacia tree is an African uh, savanna tree and the Aleppo pine is a Mediterranean forest tree. And they meet in Jordan and are separated by only 250 kilometers, which is around a three hour drive. Uh, another interesting uh, biogeographic fact is that the Jordan Valley was not only home to African flora, but uh, also uh, to some East Asian fauna, such as the Asiatic lion. Uh, this is a, uh, a photo of a famous mosaic from the Byzantine period uh, in the town of Madaba. It shows the River Jordan, the Dead Sea, the town of Jericho with its uh, famous palms. Uh, one of the fishes is swimming away from the Dead Sea because nothing lives in it. And uh, right here in this corner, there's a very pixelated lion chasing a gazelle. Uh, so historically, uh, this kind of uh, flora and fauna inhabited the entire area. The reason I mention um, these meeting points is that they also reflect uh, the culture and history of the region, which have been historically a crossroads between Asia, Europe, and Africa. Uh, other noteworthy particulars regarding the context um, are, re are some of the regional challenges facing uh, landscape architects and architects and urban planners. The most significant one being water scarcity, uh, obviously for uh, landscape architects. 
Other challenges include uh, regional conflict, which you're probably aware of, uh, rapid population growth and the refugee situation, which results in a lot of marginalized communities. Um, also long-term environmental degradation and desertification. Uh, this is just a broad uh, context to frame uh, the work I'll be presenting today. You uh, might be wondering why cultural expression uh, is so central to a lot of design in the region. Uh, most countries in the Middle East have only recently emerged from colonial domination. Jordan, for example, gained its independence in 1946, which is shortly after my own father was born. So we are still living with the aftermath of colonialism and resulting uh, the resulting uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, that is uh, characterized by uh, struggle for recognition and independent identity. Uh, and this is particularly important today because Palestinians have not been given uh, their rightful independence and statehood and, and are continuously struggling against uh, military occupation and cultural appropriation. To add to that, uh, widespread globalization poses a threat to um, culture and uh, local culture and craftsmanship. Uh, this is just a backdrop for the first project which I'll be presenting, which is the Palestinian Museum. Uh, so the Palestinian Museum is the flagship project of the Ta'awan or Welfare Association which is a non-governmental development organization set up by Palestinian philanthropists. Uh, it's located in the town of Birzeit uh, on the Birzeit University campus. The building was uh, designed by Hennigan Peng Architects and I was the collaborator on the landscape design. Uh, the project won uh, the Aga Khan Award in uh, 2019, as John already stated. Um, I just like to point out that this award is significant because it recognizes both projects, uh, uh, projects that not only demonstrate design excellence, but also have a positive impact on the quality of life. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the urban landscape of Palestine, it's characterized by a hilly terrain um, with uh, relatively dense built up areas. Uh, of limestone uh, clad buildings. And uh, since the early 20th century, limestone has been used as a cladding material. Um, the traditional villages of Palestine are built using local limestone in both cut and uh, rubble form. Um, and these are images showing the uh, semi-natural landscapes surrounding the project site. Um, I'm, calling them semi-natural because the ecological order has been disturbed um, by farming and building activities. Um, you see uh, in this image in particular, cultivated olives interspersed within uh, an oak woodland. Uh, this is the project site. Uh, it was built on a 40 hectare uh, land uh, on a hilly terrain with uh, spectacular, spectacular views uh, overlooking the hills. Uh, on a clear day, you can see the Mediterranean. I've been told I haven't really seen it. Um, so um, uh, the concept of the architecture and the landscape is inspired by the terrain of the land. Uh, the landscape of Palestine has the worked quality of a city. Every element of it has been touched and tells a story of intervention, production, culture, environment, commerce. Like a city, the terrace landscape has embedded within it its history. So the terrace landscape is a common way of organizing uh, land in semi-arid hilly climates. Uh, the terraces retain water, uh, prevent erosion, and also ease access. Um, the approach to the layout uh, of the master plan is based on working with this hilly topography. If you were to build on a flat site, an orthogonal grid is one way of organizing the master plan. On a hilly site, the grid follows the contours and the lines um, are transformed with intermediate control points and allowed to adapt to the contours. 
the layout of the building and the landscape is organized around a series of cascading terraces uh, built of dry stone walls. And the building rises uh, above the terraces, crowning the hill, so to speak. The intent was to create um, a distinctive and iconic form that is also familiar. It incorporates local materials and um, innovative detailing techniques, yet um, it's derived from traditional organizing systems. So uh, Palestine has a rich uh, and diverse native flora and also a wide range of uh, plants that are not necessarily native, but have been culturally significant. The story uh, of these influences on the landscape is represented in the museum gardens. So the landscape narrative is based on the themes of natural landscape and cultural landscape. Actually, uh, um, the carrot tree, for example, is a tree that grows in native oak forest, and the fruit has been cultivated for centuries for um, its uh, use in uh, making molasses, which is used in traditional sweets uh, and juices. So the interplay between native plants and harvesting fruit or cultivating um, plant varieties from wild origins by humans informs the plant selection for the landscape. And um, during the design process, uh, I drew upon my own experiences with our landscape, as well as uh, ethnographic research uh, and interviews with elder relatives and acquaintances who grew up um, on farms where they were much more connected to the land. And this is something that sadly is not common today in my generation and the younger one. Uh, the narrative also emphasizes the connection uh, of people to the land through these familiar crops uh, that are basic ingredients in traditional foods. The chickpea, for example, is the main ingredient in hummus and falafel. The area is known for olive, uh, pressed olives, olive oil and olive oil soap, uh, a variety of plants like um, pomegranates, peach uh, figs and uh, apricots are used in making different uh, uh, juices and used in a lot of traditional uh, desserts. This image shows the geometry of the terraces. Uh, the geometry is further tweaked to show uh, similar uh, faceting, uh, similar to the roof. So the terraces go up and down and respond to the different level changes uh, of the tweaked contours. And then ramps and pathways connect the upper and lower terraces. Uh, the landscape is organized using a, an east-west grid. Uh, and another grid is formed by the geometry of the contour lines. Uh, so the trees, which are the main structural element of the landscape, uh, they're the bones of the landscape, so to speak, are laid out uh, at the intersection of these two grids. Um, deciduous and evergreen trees alternate across the terraces uh, to show the grid system uh, also in the winter month when in the winter months when some of the plants are not in leaf. Uh, the shrubs and understory plants also follow the same geometry. The landscape narrative of the cultural, from the cultural to the natural that I mentioned before is uh, also revealed as we go down uh, the terraces. The dry stone walls on the upper terraces are more precise in their construction and they become more raw towards uh, the lower terracing. So the journey into the garden starts at the cafe terrace, which has panoramic views to the hills beyond. Um, Carib hedges, a shelter uh, from exposure to windy conditions, which uh, are typical of these uh, hilltop sites. 
As you progress down the pathways, you are surrounded by mass plantings of rosemary, lavender, rock rose, uh, which is a combination of both domesticated garden plants and plants of wild origin. Uh, the pathways are uh, in close proximity to the planted terraces and the plants almost spill over the paving so that their aroma is released uh, by the footsteps of passerbys. Scent or aroma is a central aspect of the plant selection because it's connected to memory. Many people may not recognize certain types of plants, but they often recall scents that remind them of home uh, or their childhood. The journey down the terraces also leads to olive gardens uh, planted with more uh, aromatic, uh, aromatic um, evergreen green plants that are interspersed with wild perennials. Wild lupins, which have an edible cousin, which are these uh, blue flowers coming out of this uh, planting bed, uh, uh, are eaten as a snack called turmos, which are lupin seeds, and they may be actually uh, used as a snack in other places. And uh, while we're on the topic of perennials, seasonal interest was another key consideration in the planting design. The terrace planting was planned to include uh, fruits, flowers, and seeds to be harvested throughout the year. And the museum actually makes its own olive oil and other products that are harvested from the gardens. And these are more views along uh, the aromatic walk, which is lined with plants like oregano, mint, and scented geranium. Uh, these herbs are used in uh, traditional cooking and teas and uh, for medicinal purposes, but they're not necessarily appreciated for their physical beauty. Um, some of the plants are so, so common that people don't expect to even see them in a museum garden. And in, in that way, they're planted, but in the way that they're um, planted in masses, it draws attention to them and elevates their status in a way. Uh, I call this basically um, landscaping with uh, uh, herbal teas. Uh, the lower terraces are planted with olive and pomegranate trees with an understory of rain-fed crops such as wheat and chickpea. Rain-fed agriculture has a long history in the region uh, uh, with water scarcity and uh, wheat and chickpea are staple crops that are grown or have grown in the area since um, the Neolithic, Neolithic revolution or the invention of agriculture. Um, in the area around um, 12,000 years ago. Uh, so basically this is uh, your pantry coming to life uh, in the garden. More views of the pomegranate and wheat understory. Uh, there are key highlights along the route with, within the terraces uh, and they include artworks and theme gardens. Two of the theme gardens that I'd like to mention, one is a medicinal garden, which is in this zone, and um, it showcases plants with medicinal qualities, such as caper, the storax tree, and an Artemisia herb. Uh, they're used to treat uh, deafness, high blood pressure, heart disease, and other ailments. Um, another garden in this zone um, you can't see it very clearly, but there's a central olive tree in it. It's called the Garden of Perseverance. And it's particularly significant because it symbolizes Palestinian culture and identity under duress. It's composed of plants like the prickly burnet, which uh, has a thorny uh, shell that protects it from grazing animals. And it also defoliates in summer to protect itself from drought. Um, another plant uh, planted in this garden is the salt bush plant, which is adapted to uh, living in extremely saline conditions, which would normally kill uh, most plants. And the olive tree, of course, is a symbol of Palestine 
and is very adapted to both arid climates and to uprooting and transplanting. There are around uh, 75 species of trees and shrubs and perennials in the gardens, and it's designed to function as a start to a mini botanic garden that can be augmented over time as more seeds uh, can be collected and propagated for use in the gardens. To support all of this uh, vegetation, uh, water is used very wisely in the building. Uh, it's collected from roofs and hard surfaces and stored in underwater tanks. Um, uh, the water that's collected is about 9,200 cubic meters, uh, which is actually very large compared to most projects or any project really. Um, conserving water is central to the entire scheme for both environmental and political reasons as uh, Palestinian territories have little control over their water resources and they can be cut off uh, at any time and uh, suddenly. 60% of the site is also of uh, permeable materials. Um, there's a swale that runs around uh, the site and collects water uh, from the paved services and into the underground water reservoirs. And then the overflow is diverted into the natural valley for groundwater recharge. The irrigation strategy also combines uh, areas where regular irrigation is needed and where less irrigation is needed. And over time, the rain fed and native areas will require less and less irrigation to uh, at one point, no irrigation in the future. Um, this is another project that addresses the sense of place and draws in also inspiration from the cultural landscape. It's a destination hotel in Al Ula, which is a Nabataean city uh, uh, called uh, Madain al Salih in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a col collaboration with uh, Wendell Bernal, Bernal Architects. Um, from Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, Wendell is someone who has been building in the desert for uh, many years and has a very profound understanding of it. It's located uh, outside of a UNESCO uh, protected zone and nestled around uh, these natural rock formations. Uh, the building is also nestled in the ground plane uh, in a very unobtrusive manner uh, as to not um, obstruct any of the rocks or uh, site views. Uh, it's about capturing the desert experience and the spirit of the place. Um, so, um, also in this project, there's an exploration of the interplay between the natural landscape and the cultivated one. Uh, the area is noted for its Nabataean archaeological remains and uh, its palm and citrus plantations. So there's a stark contrast between the desert landscape and uh, the lush oases of palms and citrus that are fed by groundwater. In addition to the tradition of uh, date farming and citrus farming, the archaeological remains are uh, from the Nabataean period are best known for their demonstration of uh, skillful water technologies. For many uh, cultures in water scarce regions uh, throughout the Arabian Peninsula, the man manipulation of water was not only a, a st strategic survival necessity, uh, but it also developed into a, a sophisticated art form. Uh, the landscape of the resort uh, draws on this tradition of these water technologies. Uh, this is a plan showing um, the different types of water systems. There's a mother well, which is kind of figuratively where uh, the water originates near the spa in the hotel, and it's channeled through a series of overground and underground channels into reflecting pools um, 
and uh, canals. This is uh, a view of the mother well. Um, uh, to save water, here also uh, water reuse strategies are used um, using treated water uh, that uh, comes out as gray water from the users of the resort, uh, which we are calling raw water. Uh, where, and, and so where the raw water is used for irrigation and fresh water is used for uh, reflecting pools and ornamental channels. And this is done to uh, try to lessen the impact on the underground aquifers, which are key to the survival of uh, this oasis community. Uh, different varieties of citrus trees are common in the region and are planted in both public and uh, private spaces. So there's a stark contrast between uh, the desert landscape that the uh, users experience and uh, the lush oases within the uh, pathways in the resort. Um, so this brings me to the theme of the perennial landscape. And, and by perennial landscape, I mean one that is recurring or renewed uh, and visibly so between green, uh, brown, and yellow. This image uh, illustrates um, this idea where uh, vegetation in our area is uh, very lush in the spring and the rainy season uh, with uh, lush greens and color. Uh, and in the summer and the fall, it turns into brown and yellow. Even uh, the water courses in some areas are perennial, so they disappear after the rainy season in summer and spring. Because green landscapes are so fleeting and viewed as unattainable, green really captures the imagination of people. And there's a kind of cultural idealization of green. This is a snapshot of a survey uh, that I conducted uh, 10 years ago as part of the work uh, we do at the Research Center. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. But to make a long story short, people love green. Green is equivalent to uh, gold. So this has been a professional challenge for me because I'm drawn to landscapes that are more in tune with their bioclimatic zone. So there are many messy yellow fields everywhere for half of the year. Uh, and within these ubiquitous fields that turn yellow and brown, there are plants that are overlooked and underappreciated. Um, so these are exploratory, what I call exploratory vignettes uh, that zoom in uh, on what appears to be a derelict field uh, but up close, it contains intricate patterns of airborne seeds, uh, delicate uh, uh, flower shapes, and colorful uh, thistles. These are patterns that were printed, uh, inspired by these um, lesser known plants on uh, paper and fabric for a design exhibition that was held in Hanan. This is a milk thistle. Uh, this is the wild oat, and this is the globe thistle. Um, this I'd like to show is another uh, collaborative project that I did with a photographer. Um, it celebrates the subtlety of uh, the desert landscape. It, it was shot around the Dead Sea uh, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, we walked around with a, with a giant mirror and shot beams of light uh, onto overlooked uh, elements of the landscape that are quite beautiful. So we highlighted colors, patterns, and uh, vistas. Uh, the exploration aimed at highlighting the subtleties of uh, these landscapes by a near and keen observation. So hopefully um, through this experience, uh, the, uh, the, the, the viewer emerges more informed and receptive to recognizing uh, subtle beauty of the desert landscape. Um, so these vignettes, sometimes they do translate into 
uh, design and built form uh, at the Palestinian Museum, for example. Uh, there are parts of the landscape that change with the seasons and turn from green and colorful flowers to yellow and brown. Um, another view of, this is another view of the uh, landscape showing a harvested field and what it looks like after uh, the crops have been harvested. To me, this is much more dynamic, uh, a much more dynamic landscape and in tune with the natural world around it. Inhabiting habitats, this might seem a bit maybe cryptic to some of you, but uh, the central question to me is how to build landscapes that inhabit habitats. Uh, and by habitat, I mean uh, the natural home of plants and animals and other organisms. Um, uh, I think about uh, uh, sort of what citizens these landscapes are, what sort of citizens they are. Um, building ecologically sensitive uh, landscapes are, is, a, is a challenging endeavor, um, sometimes due to the lack of resources because it's a very, landscape architecture is a very young profession here. There's only a handful of people practicing it. There isn't really a huge body of work to, um, to uh, think about. Um, and uh, the resources and materials uh, on the plant supply um, uh, aspect are also lacking. So this is always a quest in progress that I explore in various residential gardens that are uh, uh, located in oak forest in Amman. This is a, uh, an oak woodland uh, in the city and most of the oak woodlands in the city are quite degraded. Uh, due to urban expansion and overgrazing, to uh, name a few threats. Um, so the residential projects I've worked on uh, in these habitats are focused on the restoration of oak woodlands in a garden setting. And this is a collaboration with a local architect called uh, Sahel Hiyari Architects, uh, an exterior view showing the house and its surrounding landscape. And you'll notice that this photo is taken in uh, summer and uh, or early fall where the landscape uh, starts to turn yellow and brown. Uh, a very, very different view on the inside uh, with blending of the uh, existing oaks with wild roses and mock oranges. Uh, the short tree under the cantilever is actually a, a planted tree, not an existing one. And you can really only tell uh, from the size of it Um, here, um, I explored the type of companion planting you would choose in terms of wildlife value, uh, year-round interest, and uh, drought-tolerant adaptations, uh, combining both native and adapted plants. Uh, the project uh, was also about a dialogue with the wider landscape. It's a little... Uh, unclear in this picture, but uh, basically it's uh, about how you use the borrowed landscape and connect it to your landscape to make it appear larger. More uh, borrowed views and echoing of the forms of the hills beyond with the planting and the foreground. Uh, and this garden was actually finished before the interior of the house. Uh, which remained, the, the site remained somewhat of a semi-construction site. So literally the day after it was planted, I remember seeing hummingbirds and butterflies land on a, a native hibiscus shrub. And a successful garden for me is one that engages with animals uh, that we share uh, the planet with. Uh, so our, like our constructions become part of a lar larger habitat or local ecology. And those things are really hard to capture actually in <laughs> photos. Um, this is another residential project that's done in collaboration with the same architect, Zahal Hiyari. It's on a very hilly site, uh, also in an oak habitat. The house uh, nestles into the contours uh, and does not protrude much about uh, the, the hill line. Uh, here you can see the cut in the hill and how the house uh, nestles into it. Again, the use of uh, open block paving 
uh, dissolving hard surfaces and edges uh, and mitigating uh, other, uh, an otherwise harsh space used for parking and maneuvering. This is another view of uh, the area. Also, uh, this uh, project engages with the dialogue of um, the uh, surrounding landscape or the wider landscape beyond. Uh, making a user-friendly uh, garden for families often do include lawn, but it's integrated within the larger habitat by using the right companion planting. Um, these projects are not uh, only a restoration of landscapes due to environmental degradations of the ecosystem, but are also um, actually restore um, painful disruptions from construction. So this brings me to um, the other part of the lecture, which is uh, a completely different kind of work uh, about public education and outreach and community engagement. Uh, and I'm going to present some of the work we do uh, at the research center at the Center for the Study of the Built Environment. Um, uh, and I'm going to focus on community engagement, which is part of our core mission. So uh, we at CSBE, we like to think of ourselves as a think and do tank because we do a lot of applied research. Uh, we engage in print uh, and publishing um, um, online and sorry, print and web based publishing. Um, we also do short documentaries, online courses, and sometimes we do build pilot projects. And my involvement at CSBE has allowed me to explore a diversity of disciplines related to the built environment that otherwise I wouldn't be exposed to. Uh, one of our long running projects was focused on water conservation and landscapes, and it includes several publications for both the public and professionals on tips uh, and guidelines on how to conserve uh, landscape uh, water in landscapes. Uh, one of our pilot projects was the National Gallery Park for Fine Arts. Uh, the project involved renovating uh, an old park built in the 1960s. Uh, uh, usually 1960s isn't very old, uh, but in Amman, because it's uh, both an ancient city and a relatively new city, um, it was uh, a Roman site and then an Umayyad site. And then there was a period where there was not much activity and most of the building happened around the turn of the century and into the early 20th century. So the 1960s is considered uh, part of the uh, historical, uh, historical um, uh, date in the lifespan of the modern city. So it connects two um, buildings for the National Gallery uh, across the street. Uh, the intervention was a multi-purpose plaza uh, to hold activities and provide locations for outdoor sculpture displays. The park also includes sign displays of water conserving plants uh, and glass elements that act as water meters and indicate whether the plants need high, moderate, or uh, low water. Community engagement is another area we feel that we can have impact. Uh, we call uh, one of the projects uh, that has been recently run Enhancing Civic Responsibility of Youth in Schools. And the project aims at uh, facilitation, facilitating the creation of environments uh, that give students and members of the community a sense of empowerment and allows them to become agents of positive change uh, through participatory processes. Um, we do that by providing students with skills uh, and a skill set related to decision making, 
uh, and the realization of ideas. I'll just say uh, just a few words about the context of public schools in Jordan. Um, it's a very authoritarian system and the students are quite marginalized. So the process we implemented was something that most students uh, had never experienced before. Um, in the pilot project, we worked with eight public schools uh, and worked with classes uh, uh, between uh, eighth and 10th grade students. We start by doing a general survey and interview with students that pinpoint how they would like to improve uh, their school grounds. We engage them in mental mapping exercises uh, and drawing mental maps uh, in addition to interviews, usually provides us with, with information that we wouldn't get verbally. This uh, drawing, for example, by one of the students has these um, colorful, which appear to be rocks, but they are actually uh, drawings uh, that represent litter in the school. And so this particular student was bothered by the littering issue at his school. Uh, we teach uh, basic skills. Uh, we ask, uh, we uh, hold an activity with the students where they draw their own classroom by counting tiles and uh, marking them on graph paper. We also emphasize analytical skills by having them um, uh, apply design thinking to a familiar object. Uh, many of you might be familiar with these um, method kits used a lot in uh, urban planning uh, exercises. Uh, we have them think through the process of redesigning their own school desk. And uh, uh, they come up with, uh, so they engage their minds in coming up with solutions to improve uh, an ordinary object that they use every day that some find really uncomfortable. So a lot of them thought of adding cushions or a little groove so their pencils don't slide off or even adding a hook uh, for their jackets. We also have them perform site analyses. Um, we present them first with key concepts and then we do mini charrettes with the students. Uh, we have them do a school-wide survey uh, to come to a consensus uh, by voting uh, to uh, decide on what the most desirable improvement is for them and the entire school. These are some of the design charrettes. And um, keep, we have them keep in mind that we're working with very small budgets. And we do that intentionally because we want the pilot to be replicable. Uh, we work with uh, several mural artists on uh, drawing exercises with the students. Uh, we do modeling and setting out of uh, uh, the ideas that they come up with. And we also involve them in the construction or, or kind of parts of the light construction because uh, legally we're not allowed to have them be near heavy construction. These are some of the uh, projects that the students came up with, transforming school environments into colorful play fields or improving a classroom, making a hallway into a uh, more public space for seating and gathering, doing small improvements and adding color in uh, otherwise um, quite sterile uh, schoolyards. Um, we produced a manual um, on this process that's available, available to the public. Everything we do is published on our website and is available to the public. Um, right now, we are currently engaging in a uh, agricult urban agriculture project. Uh, we're still currently working with schools on it. And uh, right now, it's been disrupted, obviously, by the pandemic, pandemic but we uh, plan to continue working on it. 
we uh, introduce uh, ideas about hydroponic planting, composting, and uh, that's it. I would like to end with that. I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura. Um, if you want to, uh, we can go ahead and get started with um, some questions if you have time. Um, sure. To make an announcement to um, to our, our participants, our attendees, that uh, if you have questions, you can submit them at the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we have a question now from a faculty member, um, Paolo Viti. I don't know why I did that, um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, read the question from, from Paolo to get us started. Um, he said that the Palestinian Museum is an extraordinary intervention, which he had the chance to visit uh, a year ago. Um, and his question is, to what level do you believe that interventions such as this, which seek a balanced approach between architecture and the environment, can impact future development in both Palestine and Jordan? Um, thank you for the for the um, flattering um, words on the design of the museum. Um, I think um, because it's been recognized, it will have an impact uh, on the way uh, that uh, architecture and landscape architecture uh, will be practiced in the future. Um, for the first time, uh, there's actually uh, a landscape that people can interact with that is um, responsive to the environment and that is uh, culturally representative. Uh, and the building uh, is also uh, that way uh, and is very different from some of the uh, more nostalgic interpretations of um, uh, of looking at tradition. So I think it would uh, have an impact. So um, I have a question on behalf of, of some of the students who might be might be watching. So you went to architecture school, obviously, and decided to specialize in landscape architecture. And then the majority of our graduates probably won't be landscape architects themselves. But do you have any sort of advice for them on, on how to approach working with landscape architects or how to think about the landscape on jobs when there isn't a designated landscape architect? Um, I would say um, observation. You can learn a lot about your surroundings by just looking at them and noticing trees. I mean, I guess I never used to notice trees and plants when I was in architecture school, but now when I'm driving around, I'm always looking around, being very observant, looking at uh, leaf patterns, when things bloom, um, uh, different details, and trying to look up plants and understand them, uh, understand the shape of trees and how you can use them for shade or screening or um, you know, looking at how you use these different plants. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, really look at uh, topography. I think um, collaboration between architects and landscape architects on how the building engages with uh, a site and how it sits on the land in early stages of the project can uh, really improve both. Um, we have a question now from, from a student. Um, let me try to see if, Mary, can you ask your question out loud? Yes. Um, so I, alongside many of my classmates, obviously are um, enamored with traditional architecture. Um, but you mentioned that sometimes that turns into nostalgia when looking at historic architecture. Um, do you have any advice for breaking out of that mindset? I mean, it's 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 a it's a mindset here that's very common. I mean, you see uh, a lot of architecture 
in the Gulf um, that is using a lot of uh, traditional forms, let's say. And I think when those forms are actually accompanied by the right craftsmanship, uh, they tend to be uh, more appropriate than ones that are uh, um, uh, paying lip service really to the uh, to the reference or uh, to the precedent. Um, so I think if you look at the essence uh, of uh, local materials, uh, what's being used as uh, local material in terms of building uh, and incorporating it uh, in a modern or more contemporary form uh, is a way to kind of reference uh, historical precedents without necessarily um, uh, building in the same in the same way. Thank you. We have a, a question now from Professor Duncan Strike. Hello, Laura. It's great to see you again. You look great. <laughs> and Hear you. you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't look great. Um, and you, your work is so impressive, and uh, it's hard to believe it was all those years ago. Uh, I have very happy memories of you. I'm so glad that you're presenting your work, and thank you for sharing all this, and a little bit thank of your you. journey, and also your uh, work with the with the children. That's so so wonderful. Um, so your museum project uh, reminds me of certain uh, recent museums in other parts of the world especially American museums, which I may be more familiar with, recent ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the landscape, although it's landscape and architecture. Um, so I just wanted to ask you if you agree with that. And then second, who are your favorite landscape architects that you uh, learn from? Um, the second part of the question, well, thank you first um, uh, for the compliments. It's heartwarming to hear that from a former professor. Um, in terms of the landscape architects that I uh, look to, um, one that comes to mind is Roberto Burla Marx, um, a Brazilian landscape architect that was uh, really the father of uh, the modernist uh, landscape movement in Brazil. And he was very much uh, in tune with uh, the, the local and native flora and integrated it and actually uh, formed a sort of a Brazilian style of, of landscape architecture. Um, other uh, practitioners uh, whose work uh, I look to are um, uh, West Eight um, from uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, and uh, Catherine Gustafsson, who's a contemporary landscape architect who I feel has a very uh, sensitive approach to uh, landscape architecture. Thank you. Great answers. Uh, we have just a, a couple of questions. I know it's very late for you, Laura, so we won't keep you okay. too long. Um, but we have a question from a, another student who's asked, asked me to verbalize the question for her. Um, Sam uh, is wondering if there are any Notre Dame School of Architecture experiences or lessons um, that became especially interesting or obvious during your study um, or during your practice. Is there anything uniquely about your Notre Dame experience that influenced your career? Um, obviously for everybody, uh, it's the Rome program. I think uh, it's central to your education, um, of uh, understanding cities and urbanism and what makes good urbanism and experiencing that firsthand. Uh, that's crucial for, for anybody, whether you're in landscape architecture, uh, urban design or architecture. Uh, the other uh, is actually uh, the, the classical architecture skills that we learned. Um, they can be applied really to anything proportion, uh, um, looking at a party, designing, um, uh, you know, understanding how uh, space and plans uh, can be laid out with uh, 
symmetries and asymmetries, and even looking at the details of the orders and um, uh, proportional systems, uh, golden ratios, all of that. I think these are universal um, uh, design tools that can be applied at any time. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a question from an alum, um, Jose Barbosa, uh, who commented that you have magnificent work and he wanted to know if you would consider the use of landscaping to produce food in areas where hunger is a critical problem. Uh, definitely, I think that's why now urban agriculture has uh, been a focus for us because um, agriculture is uh, transforming in uh, very technologically uh, advanced ways where uh, a lot of plants are grown without soil, hydroponically, aeroponically, using aquaponics and fish and nutrients. Uh, uh, vertical farming is uh, another thing where artificial light and, and plants are grown within buildings um, that will transform the way uh, we do agriculture and may even uh, save uh, lands from being degraded from agricultural practices. Um, agriculture can be uh, done even in an industrial areas when we're talking about this uh, vertical technological way of farming. So that I think would go a long way in uh, countries where resources are scarce or, uh, or water is or lands are not available even and where there is significant hunger. Thank you. Um, we're gonna have one last question um, from Tom Reykjavik, another alum. Um, Tom, if you're able to unmute, you can ask the question yourself. But I don't see that he is, so I will go ahead and, and read his question as well. Um, he said, Congratulations on your beautiful work. Um, and he was questioning if you had ever been called upon to collaborate on the development of urban design projects and the integration of plant and water elements in urban placemaking, um, such as squares, promenades, and streetscapes. Nice to hear from you, Tom. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I've worked um, with the city of Amman on um, some urban design projects. Um, uh, during a, a phase in the history of the city where they were doing uh, a new master plan and a vision for 2030, 10 years from now. Um, and uh, we did a lot of work on um, looking at uh, streets and plazas downtown and how to upgrade those. Um, we did uh, a lot of work on the ideas of shared streets and reducing automobile traffic and making the city more pedestrian. Uh, we looked at transportation networks and how um, bus rapid transit systems or uh, undergrounds can, can also uh, facilitate transportation and reduce uh, the use of the car. Uh, the city of Amman is very reliant on uh, automobiles because it was uh, you know, developed mostly in the modern period. So it was planned around it, a lot of the zoning laws and setbacks and, and all of these uh, contribute to it being, I mean, it's not like Houston or anything like that. It's, it's on a much smaller scale, but it is automobile dependent. And some of the, a lot of the urban design work that needs to be done in the city and needs to address uh, that issue. So that was the end of my questions, unless um, Stefano, you or John have anything uh, to add as we wrap up? You're muted, Stephanie. John first, perhaps. Uh, Laura, it's great to see you again. What a fantastic presentation. I was fascinated by your work. And uh, um, I, uh, I know that you and I are going to actually get a meet again after this meeting here and have another extended conversation. So that'll be fun to do. I'm just just happy to see my classmates again. It was just, it's, it's exciting for me being 25 years out and missing my, actually we missed our class reunion this year because of COVID. So, uh, so I'm very happy yeah. that Laura was able to do this for us this year. So thank you, Laura. It's great to see you and look forward to speaking with you more. On behalf of the school, Laura, I want to thank you for this marvelous uh, lecture and for your work as a whole, for your body of work. Uh, it is inspiring in reminding us really how much we have to look at nature itself as a source of beauty and sustenance 
and hope in our in our struggle to to secure a future for our planet, which seems to be at some uh, trouble right now. Um, this reminds me that in the years to come, in the few years to come, we should be looking more carefully at introducing uh, landscape studies into our graduate programs and see those as being integral with the study of uh, both uh, buildings and, and urban design. And uh, for that, we'd love to stay in touch with us and as we will with you, I promise you. And we hope to see you very soon again in, in South Bend. Thank, thank you for you. being here tonight and thank you for thank staying you. up until 1.30 in the morning. It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for thank the you, invitation Mark. and for your kind words. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. Take care. Bye-bye.